Hey everybody, welcome to Meet the Mets Executives Panel. Um, thank you for sitting in and uh, hope you can get a Crane Paul autograph as well. Uh, this is, I'm Shannon from MetsPolice.com. It is a blog about the Mets that covers everything but the games. So we talk about the stuff that aren't the actual, hey, why didn't uh, we make a pitching change in the sixth inning? I don't care about that stuff. I care about the stuff on the table, the bobbleheads, the marketing, the tickets. And I've got a great panel here, and um, most of these guys have done this before with me. So Mark Fine is Executive Director of Marketing. Will Carafello is Senior Director of Social Media. And Kenny Caperta is Executive Director of Ticket Sales. So to jump into the panel, and I think, Will, I'm going to throw this one your way. And Mark and I have kind of talked about this on the side. By the way, by the way, by the way, I know everybody's always looking for a conspiracy theory. And I do have notes here. <laughs> I don't want you guys to think like, oh, the Mets said don't ask them about da 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 We're just friends. We're just having a nice panel. OK. Absolutely. So about an hour ago, Brody tweeted, hey, congrats to the Queens Baseball Convention. You guys sold out. Awesome. Thank you, Brody, for doing that. And I scroll down, and about three tweets in, it's, <laughs> why don't you guys sign Harper? So my question for Will, on social media, you could post, hey, guys, the Mets have cured cancer. And three <laughs> tweets down, it'll be like, why don't you sign free agent here? How do you deal with that on a daily basis and not just, like, want to throw your phone? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely uh, something we expect, uh, unfortunately. We also realize, too, that... Um, you know, that's what the you know the fans are into that. So, you know, we're we're going to take our um, we're going to take those comments and uh, again we're not bringing them back to Brody. Brody's not looking through his feed saying, "Oh, let me see what moves I should make based on Twitter." So, um, you know, the it, it's part of the territory. Um, definitely, when I was a little bit younger, I probably you know took them a little more to heart. But you know, right now I know th the team has a plan. We're focused on putting the best team on the field. Brody's the right person for that, and you know he's he's out there doing it. So you know the, the chatter happens, but we w it doesn't affect me and, and my team and what we're trying to put out there. So is it just white noise, and you just have to fight through it, and just you you know that that's going to happen no matter what you tweet or Facebook post, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're always looking for ways to get better. So if there is something there that is valid, we'll definitely take that and, and talk about it. But yeah, I mean, those type of things, it's out of our control. We're not going to be able to. Uh, to pull that off, so you know that that to us kind of gets white noise. We we do joke of how many comments will it take before <laughs> we see that. So, and the answer is three. <laughs> if Sometimes it's one. If that many, right? First, <laughs> yeah. why don't you? Uh, exactly. Yeah. So, um, uh, on Twitter, I, I too, and I definitely give it out on Twitter. On Twitter, I was accused of being a sellout, and I promised the people who accused me of being a sellout that I would ask Mark Fine, director of I marketing. I saw that. Yes. Why haven't you signed free agent X, Mark Fine? This is clearly what you do for the Mets. I demand answers. Why haven't you signed more free agents, Mark Fine? As, you, as, as I responded on Twitter, because I saw you were getting a little bit of heat, uh, you know, we're on the business side. Uh, we have a great, relations, uh, great, great relationship with our baseball, our operations team. We did with Sandy Alderson. That continues with Brody. Brody is very active on social media, a little more so, as I think you can tell, than, than Sandy was. Um, you know, coming from CAA, coming from that agent world, he's got a really sharp marketing background. That being said, the marketing department isn't a determining really how Brody goes about, Brody and his team go about free agency and building the uh, 2019 version of the team. I would imagine from the marketing chair, when there are new, exciting, very shiny new Mets, that the job gets a little easier, that it's different than, you know, maybe in a September in a lost season going, hey, Absolutely. come out on a Tuesday night, like going into the season for all of you. This has got to be tremendously exciting. It, it is. And, you know, hope springs eternal. I mean, regardless of the season, you know, we really try and build that excitement up leading into opening day, regardless of the year. But absolutely, this is one of the more exciting off seasons that we've had in a little while. And it certainly helps us from the marketing department side to be able to talk to uh, a plan moving forward, a plan that we're that Brody and team has really shared with all of us in the front office, uh, not just for baseball operations, and one that we can get behind and, and take bits and pieces of that and include that in our creative, in our marketing, in our go-to-market creative to get the fans excited. 
So let's. You brought some props. Um, yeah. Why don't you walk us through the bobbleheads? I think I've seen designs of some of these on social. I don't. Yep. I don't think the Fraser. That might be new news. Or look, so. Tell us what you brought. Well, for us this year, when we approached the promotional schedule, we wanted it to connect with pop culture as much as possible. And not all of our promotional schedule has been released yet. And those folks who follow it can see there's some to be determined still on our schedule around July 5th, around July 7th, a couple in September as well. So we're not completely done with the promo calendar yet. But um, we partnered with WWE this year because WrestleMania is coming to MetLife Stadium on Sunday, April 7th. We play both on Saturday, April 6th, and on Sunday, April 7th. So we thought it would be a great tie-in to have that connection with WWE 80,000 people uh, in MetLife Stadium, a bunch more than that, just coming into the city that aren't necessarily from New York and trying to capture that market to come to the ball game that day um, and to go after fans of both Mets and WWE. And um, WWE, very cool people to work with. Um, they're a very innovative brand. Um, they're going to let us know at the end of February which superstars are most likely going to make it out to the game. And they're likely to be some of the bigger um, men and women, bigger wrestlers, because of the timing of this. We have a day game on Saturday. That works better for them than a night game on Saturday. So they're pretty clear. Um, so we're going to have uh, hopefully two or three of those superstars that could be high-level guys or, or ladies that are going to be coming to the game that day to participate in what we have ongoing. But the first 25,000 fans that day, Saturday, April 6th, uh, get a Todd Frazier WWE bobblehead. Game of Thrones, um, some of you might have noticed that other teams over the last couple of years have done that. Uh, they partner with Game of Thrones. We decided to get in on that this year, being that this is going to be the last season of Game of Thrones. Um, it's obviously one of the most popular shows on television. They come back, I believe, April the 14th. This giveaway date with Noah is April the 27th, which is first 25,000 fans, Saturday, April 27th. Um, Noah, as you might remember, a couple of years ago was an extra on the show. I think he got killed off pretty quickly, actually. I think it was a five, <laughs> six-second scene. So uh, Noah made sense to have him on the throne. We will have the actual throne at the ballpark that night as well um, for fans to interact with. So uh, first 25,000 fans uh, that night, Noah Syndergaard, Game of Thrones, bobblehead. And then you just saw uh, we, don't have, we don't have the um, bobblehead, the physical bobblehead yet, but we announced Spider-Man over the weekend. Peter Parker, as you know, is, is a, a Mets fan. In the trailer, there was a Mike Piazza um, pennant. So uh, we wanted to have Marvel, if you, know, if you go back into the 70s or 80s comic strip, Spider-Man goes to Shea Stadium, he's wearing a Mets cap, and he's holding a banner. Marvel allowed us on the base of the bobblehead, which makes it different than any other bobblehead they're doing with other Major League Baseball teams to have that banner and that cap on the base. So uh, we're excited about that one. That's a Sunday giveaway, a Sunday, July 7th giveaway to the first 25,000 fans. Uh, and then we have a Star Wars give giveaway as well. And we have a couple more pop culture giveaways that, are, that we've signed NDAs with. So we're going to be announcing later in this offseason that are also going to be pretty exciting. Back there, um, let's start with Spider-Man. Yeah. So, um, in the new Spider-Man Spider Spider trailer, there is a... Can you hear me or...? It just went off. Check, check, check. Okay. Uh, in the new Spider-Man trailer, we saw that he had. Kind of boring. Yeah. In the new Spider-Man trailer, we saw that Peter Parker has a Mike Piazza pennant. That trailer, that pennant also appeared in the first movie. Right. Anyway, so we'll put up a post about it. I, I'm assuming it was you. Um, and that led to a wonderful Twitter discussion that day of, well, why would Peter Parker be a Mike Piazza fan? He should be a David Wright fan based upon his age. Um, let's start there. Why, why do you guys suppose Peter Parker is a Mike Piazza fan, other than Mike Piazza's a Hall of Famer and we all love him? My personal theory that I like is that Aunt May thought Mike Piazza was a little cute and she bought the pennant, but I'd be curious on your personal theories. Aunt, Aunt May looks a lot younger in this movie than I remember her from previous Yes, for sure. As well. But I'll let Will take that one. Yeah, I mean, as a... I, I, 
grew up in the 80s. I'm a Mets fan. I still appreciate Tom Seaver because he's the greatest, uh, you know, Met to ever put on the jersey. You know, for somebody like Peter Parker, it's very possible. And it, it is a Hall of Fame banner. So it could be, you know, again, if I was around his age, which we put at 17, would you yeah. put at 17? Um, you know, that obviously happened just a few years ago. So it could have been an opportunity for him to either go up to Cooperstown, take home a nice uh, piece of memorabilia. Um, I think he just may appreciate the Mets overall. So when, when one of your own goes into the highest honor a single player can get, um, you know, he may have not seen Mike Piazza play or maybe towards the end of his career, but, um, you know, he just may appreciate the Mets overall. So, you know, support, supporting one of his own, if you will. So then, so, so what I love, and again, I'll plug my own side. If you find this part of the discussion interesting, MetsPolice.com, I would much rather debate Spider-Man for a day than the pitching <laughs> change in the sixth <laughs> inning. So we do this for an entire day. Like, what? I, he should be a right fan. And then the next day, Will drops. Oh, yeah, by the way, there's a Spider-Man bobblehead. Well played, sir. You knew. <laughs> you knew that was coming. That was really well done. Um, so I look at Noah Syndergaard. Yeah. Now, I'm not a marketing guy, mm -hmm. but I have to imagine... What a wonderful person to bet on his star power. He gets it. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is telling to me about how he gets it is unlike some other players that might take a superhero identity too seriously, you know, he walks around in a Thor t-shirt that is way too tight, letting you know that he doesn't actually think that he's Thor. He doesn't actually think he's the god of lightning, but he leans in on all these things and... Um, the, talk to me about your experiences with Noah Syndergaard. I, I just think he's got New York City star power and gets it. I think it depends on the player. And Noah, as you mentioned, is one of those guys who really sees the benefit of social media and reaching out to fans and being connected with them and kind of having a little fun with Mr. Matt, you know, which may, is, may, be, may be overplayed at this point <laughs> since it's been a few years. <laughs> But he's, he's really um, an easy guy to work with. And he, like you said, he has that star power just because he delivers stuff. You know, he's a high-velocity starting pitcher um, who is tall. He has long hair. He has long blonde hair. He fits the image. He has a quirky personality that he shows off on social media. And he's very pop culture based. So, you know, back in 2015 when Noah first came up, Within a month, uh, the Mets, a couple of folks from the Mets marketing department went over to Marvel and started having that conversation. And it took a year and a half for the Noah Syndergaard as Thor bobblehead to come to life in 2017 and then 2018. Um, but we immediately saw that just by getting to know him in the minors. And we saw Star written over him that early, really when we drafted him uh, he's or w when we required him. He's just fantastic. So with the bobbleheads, I'm always curious at whatever number we pick, any sure. premium. We're going to get, we're going to give away 10,000 hats. We're going to give away a million towels. How do you guys approach that number? So I think you believe, you, I believe you mentioned the number is 25,000 yeah. bobbleheads. Um, how is that number approached? And then I have a follow-up question as, it, as uh, it applies to security, I'd be curious about. So let's start with just how, how, why not everybody gets one or why not sure. only five people get one? So I'll go through each of the, the promo categories. Free Shirt Fridays are all fans. Our research has shown that you don't necessarily come to the game for the t-shirt. So the t-shirt for us is more of a branding play. If we can put out, give every fan in attendance there, whether it be 25,000 or 42,000, a t-shirt or a replica jersey, I think all of you would admit that you're going to see those shirts around town, and it's a very good branding play, uh, and that's how we approach it from a marketing, uh, marketing standpoint, where the item itself doesn't necessarily sell on Friday nights. It's more to put Mets t-shirts in the hands of 40,000 people. With these items, what we call our A-plus premium items, we generally go first 25,000. And last year, you saw us go from first 15 to first 25. That was based on once, is that I was in the rotunda during the Cindergard as Thor bobblehead day when we gave away first 15,000. And we saw people coming through the gates, unfortunately, 
who wanted one and didn't get one and had waited in line a while and certainly were deserving of one. And that's something that we wanted to take care of in 2018 by going even deeper. So now, even though fans, many of you probably in this room have waited a couple hours in line, if you did that last year, if you're in line basically when gates open, you're pretty safe in terms of getting one. And that wasn't the case two years ago. And then going to Sundays, family Sundays, and some of our less premium Saturday giveaways, we go first 15,000 fans this year with Mother's Days and Father's Day. It's, it's all moms or all dads. That's generally that item is a nice to have and not totally a, nece a necessary, I'm going to purchase a ticket because I want that item. We sell family Sundays, McDonald's family Sundays as a whole. You get an item. For kids, there's a lot of activities of both inside and outside of the ballpark, and you can run the bases after the game. So that's generally how we've approached quantities of giveaway items and how we go to market with that strategy. So my follow-up question is, and, and I don't have the answer to this. We live in challenging times. Hypothetically, we're going to give away Syndergaard bobbleheads. There are 25,000 of them. The Mets are playing well. It's a nice day, and there are 40,000 people, and the net effect is the line starts two and a half hours early. Okay, Mets, why don't you open the gates at 8 a.m.? Then people will just line up at 5.30 a.m. and so on and so on. Um, you know, I worry about, I truly worry about, and, and not a shot at the Mets, I sure. worry about the modern environment and some of the incidents we have seen in Europe yeah. as it applies to security perimeter. And I worry about a line stretching to the parking lot. I, I don't have the answer, and I'm not coming at you, because as I analyze it as a non-expert, okay, let's make the perimeter bigger and bigger and bigger, but at some point, there's still that line. And I'm, I, I don't know if you have internal conversations about this or what a solution might be. And then I guess that makes me come back to, well, if you gave away 47,000 bobbleheads, we could give it to everybody on the way out and right. eliminate the line. Mm -hmm. And again, I want to be fair here, and, yeah. and, and I, I don't have a solution. No, fair is, is we absolutely do have conversations about these things. Um, I think, or the data tells us that 2018 was a little bit better because probably some of you in the room were kind of used to, hey, I got to get in line at 8 in the morning to get this thing, uh, or w realistically 1 o'clock for a 7-10 game. That is a little too much. We wanted to provide enough for the fans that were waiting in line. At the same time, from a security perspective, we don't want to have any issues. We've been very fortunate not to have issues. I, we are certainly aware of some of the issues that you mentioned that take place, um, that have taken place overseas, uh, which we generally try to provide as much security as possible. We also made the adjustment uh, where our gates are opening two hours, and it's not just the rotunda gates, it's all gates open two hours prior to the game. Uh, let me switch gears and get Kenny involved in the tickets. So, uh, I, again, I don't know. I imagine you're having a pretty decent spring and the buzz is pretty good. And, uh, you know, while you've got the floor, why should I come out to City Field this summer? Yeah, of course. And, uh, you know, great question. But I think, you know, from our perspective, we're certainly excited about, you know, the changes that have taken, you know, place in the off season. From our position, we're excited about how the roster has changed year over year. Um, and the impact that certainly has on our fans and the fan experience. I, I've seen some other teams introduce something called ballpark pass. I, I haven't experienced it, but uh, being very generic, generic baseball team will sell a monthly standing room pass with a price point of, say, uh, $30 the Brewers are offering, and that allows you to get into the park, and you don't have a seat, and you have to float around. Have the Mets talked about doing such a thing? Does that not make sense given where the team is? Um, is this something we could see? Yeah, of course. Great question. I think, you know, from our seat, we're always looking at new and innovative ways uh, to, you know, positively impact our, our packaging, our ticketing initiatives. And we have looked at, you know, pl you know, platforms like that in the past. But what we have found is a lot of those early adopters, some of those other teams out there that have embraced that model, have since pivoted. Uh, so for us, we just felt it didn't really make sense. Uh, Mark and I, over the years, we've gone back and forth on start times, specifically the, the endless debates of what time a baseball game should start on a Saturday afternoon. Well discussed. New topic. <laughs> Have you guys considered 640 starts? I've seen some other teams pulling it up. Now, again, I come from a time when Friday night games were 805, and right. we were fine with it. However, the length of a baseball game has gotten longer, and 640 is a thing. Would, would, you, yeah. would you do that? Well, we have, we have talked about it and considered it. 
And you're going to laugh. You're gonna, this will sound silly, but we're even looking at potentially in the future going from 7.10 to 7.05. And I know that sounds like the intentional pitch. It's a, you know, how much time are you really saving by doing an intentional walk? Um, but minutes matter. Um, and we are, you know, looking at each of those things. Now, what we've seen specifically about 6.40 is when people check in and actually, you know, uh, clock in with their ticket, um, generally most of our traffic is coming between 6.40 and 7.30. So we don't believe that we're going to see that if we moved it back, particularly on a weekday, when you have more automobiles coming to our games than you do, let's say, across the town, uh, that that would necessarily be beneficial. I think that's what to keep in mind, the difference between us and maybe the other facilities in town is that we have more automotive traffic, more parking is I wouldn't say issues, more parking spaces, more parkers uh, than the other teams, the other venues do in town. We are looking at it, and we look at it every year. And as silly, again, as the 710 to 705 thing sounds, that's something that we're considering hard beyond 2019. So just playing around with start times. I, I found myself in Chicago last summer at a Friday 1 o'clock game in the middle of the summer. Yeah. Those are great. It was the greatest yeah. thing. So, you know, one of my thoughts of the day, I've got the blog, hey, i got to post something today, was would you ever do a Friday, like a one-off, like Friday afternoon, like, and, and try and make it a thing? Or is that crazy talk because, dude, we'll just play at 710 and we know we'll sell 35,000 tickets. Why mess with it? Well, Wrigley has a, a tradition, obviously, of day games. They actually have legally are required to do a number of day games. Friday makes the most sense. Um... Unlikely, I would see us doing that uh, beyond opening day. Uh, it is really cool at, in Chicago at Wrigley. However, I think we would go back to we're gonna we're gonna pull a bit a bigger gate, more people for a Friday night game. Makes total sense. For for any of you, um, are are you seeing a graying of the baseball fan, or are you worried about the millennials, or you're worried about whatever we're calling the generation of current fifteen year olds? Uh, again, issues with the game, pace of play is discussed almost every year at the league level. Uh, are, are you finding it harder to tap into those younger generations in, um, never mind other sports, other teams, Fortnite. Fortnite is a thing. Um, hey, do you want to watch the Mets? No, I want to shoot people on Fortnite. That's a thing. Um, so what are the challenges with, um, you know, you've got me and you'll have me till I die, but what about when I die, who's going to be a Mets fan? Yeah, I think that uh, it is much more challenging to reach Generation Z, which is considered 18 and under. Millennials are considered born between 1980 and 2000. And we've spent a lot of time on Generation Z uh, because the study goes that if you attend your first game by age 8, you'll attend 59% more games over a lifetime than if your first game is at age 14. That's a big difference. Um, and if it's age five that you attend your first game, you're going to tw attend twice as many games over a lifetime than if your first game is age 14. So I think that's why it's important. That wh that's why our Family Sundays brand is important. That's why our kids club is very important to engage with that age group. And that's why we look at things like times. Um, because I get where that question's coming from. We don't, we don't want the game to extend too long past somebody's bedtime where it makes it uncomfortable to go out to a game or even to watch a game you know, on SNY. Um, so we're playing with that, and we completely... I think the commissioner, since he's come aboard in 2015-ish, I believe, uh, has done an amazing job of making sure efforts from the MLB commissioner's office are, go, are going towards Little League Baseball, starting the game early. I've got a son um, who's 11 years old, and it's different than I think when we were kids where he's got a bag and he's got the helmet and he's got the bat and the batting gloves. We don't want this to be an expensive game like other sports have that connotation. We want to play ball, whether that's playing catch, whether that's playing stickball, wiffle ball, or whether that is playing organized baseball or softball. So it's participation across the country in baseball and softball have grown uh, that's really due to the commissioner's office and their efforts there. 
but it's a continual process. The fact is it is much harder to reach this generation than any other generation before. So, Will, how do you... Well, no, so that's, yeah. that's precisely why Mr. Met tweets the term, like, lit. That, that's, that was my next oh, follow-up. Yeah, I, I was <laughs> busting on, Mr. Met said, lit, what? Uh, but then, Th that's so you've got to... solve gotta, our problem. You, you have to deal with the <laughs> me's out there who are going to be like, oh, I can't believe Mr. Met said lit. He would never say that. But my 15-year-old speaks that way. So yep. how do you negotiate the middle with a very wide fan base? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we look at each platform separately for that. So... You know, for instance, your Snapchat language, your Instagram, your Instagram story language is probably going to be a little bit different than Twitter and definitely from Facebook. Um, Twitter is one of those grounds where, you know, our age range varies. You know, we do have, you know, younger kids, teenagers. We also have, you know, people like myself and, and beyond my age that use Twitter as a, it's the only real time platform that's still out there. So, um you know, we have to navigate that. You know, we know that our age range varies. And unfortunately, specifically to Twitter, not everything we post is going to fit everyone. We do try our best to put, you know, Facebook content that's going to be video content that's going to be a little more towards an older audience, whereas, you know, Snapchat and Instagram, it's quick. You know, we're, 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 not, <laughs> we're, we're not putting a lot of, you know, meat and potatoes there. So um, the focus really... Um, or, or I guess the tricky spot is, is Twitter. You know, that's where we know we have a wide pool of fans. So Twitter has become a very interesting second screen. Like, I, I just, I'm addicted to it, especially during a game. Um, you know, Will, I'd like to thank you for even still speaking to me after the <laughs> amount of times I've thrown a grenade your direction. How do you deal with, um, or how do you plan, nah, rephrasing, we, we live in an age now of cord cutting. I have cut the cord. Um, I liked my previous provider, but I was looking at the, the equipment rentals and the fees, and I was like, this is crazy. And I found a new way to get SNY so I can watch my Mets games. I understand technology. I understand physics. I understand the speed of light. Yep. I'm going to see the home run go over the fence 30, 35 seconds after it actually happened. And if your account spoils me, I'm going to be a cranky pants about it. But I'm only one fan. You are? Yeah, no way, right? I didn't notice that. <laughs> <laughs> but how, how do you handle that approach? Or, or what is the role of social media? Is the, is the point of the Mets account to give me score updates, like right now? Like, it, can it wait 45 seconds? It could. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the one hard thing to, to navigate is that emotion. You know, you got to keep in mind, we're there live. We're seeing it live. You know, if it's a it's a, a you know a home run or a big play or something, honestly, we we probably lose time based on like yes, okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, you know we get excited. And it's like no, 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 we got a job to do. So I mean, again, we have a we have a team that's that is extremely passionate. Everyone uh, on our team grew up a Mets fan, um, so that does play a little bit of a factor. But now that um, people are cutting the cord and people are watching it via. Um, the ballpark app or, or, or um, you know, get, they're, they're getting it on their phone, they're, they're watching SNY in different, you know, it's something we've had to navigate because we do have, we do see people say, it hasn't happened yet for me. You know, yep, we're at the game, we see it live, we share that. So it is something we, we, we've definitely talked about and we've, we were having to navigate. We want to be able to provide, um, you know, content real time for our fans to engage with. Um, and, in the past, we've, we've seen the opposite of like, you know, it would take us time to get the photo from the photographer and then we tweet it out and then people are like, this happened two minutes ago, why are you even bothering? So we, you know, <laughs> we've had to, we've, we've now seen the switch where people were saying, hey, you're too slow when you send it a minute or two after it happens to people saying, it hasn't happened for me yet. And that's something we, you know, we, we've definitely looked at and we're trying to navigate. Um, you know, I, I will say Major League Baseball Advanced Media has done a really good job of being a, able uh, for us to uh, cut our own gifts and uh, provide the video highlights in game, which a couple of years ago was not an option for us. So we're trying to make that second screen experience um, really positive for fans. It, but obviously, knowing the the landscape in which we're working in, that that is going to be a factor. It's going to be a okay. Collect yourself. Is this the best tweet we can send out at this time? Then okay, let's go ahead and do that. Let's. You know, let's be mindful of that. Somebody who's 30 seconds, 35 seconds behind, it may not, it may not have, it, they may have not experienced it on their own first. And one of the challenges is physics. A, a 
define now. A Mets yeah. fan in Los Angeles will get the information slightly slower than a Mets fan in Queens, right. just yeah. the speed of light is a thing. Yeah. The internet is a thing. And so that's one of the challenges you face. I think Twitter as a platform should embrace the second screen watching. I mean, they really should put in some sort of like delay everything 30 seconds a, as they head forward. You guys have no control over that. But it just as, 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 a, as a power user who especially likes doing it during live events, it can be just very frustrating across the board. Um, you know, last week with the NFL playoffs, like I DVR'd the first game. I don't like commercials. I started an hour late, but the net effect is I had to stay off the internet for an hour. So, um, all right, so Mark, a few years back, I, in my, you know, cutesy-ish way, said, hey, Mark, you know, uh, it's going to be the 50th anniversary of 1969 <laughs> in a few years, and you assured me on the spot the Mets were aware of this and would definitely honor the 1969 Mets. We have all lived long enough to get to 2019. You guys do appear to be honoring the 69 Mets. Please take the floor and tell us about the amazing things you're gonna do. Sure, uh, June 28th through 30th, uh, we have our great alumni relations team led up by Lorraine Hamilton and Jay Horowitz working on that weekend. Uh, and it's gonna be incredible. We put RSVPs out, or we put invitations out to every living member of the 69 team. Promotionally that weekend, we'll be giving a replica jersey away to all fans in attendance that Friday. We'll have the uh, pregame ceremony, which will be really special, uh, featuring the 69 members and their families uh, on the field, along with giving out a, uh, a pennant giveaway uh, on that Saturday, June 29th, and then a replica ring. It's now going to be a Sunday night game, a 7.05 Sunday night game, rather than an 8 o'clock night game, uh, where we give the replica ring out to the first 15,000 fans. So... Uh, a lot more details still to come, but that is the, the weekend we plan on re recognizing the 69 team uh, for their 50th anniversary. As a follow-up, you know, Mark, <laughs> next year is the 20th anniversary of the 2000 NL champions. Any thoughts to that effect or too early? It is too early. We have not really thought about that. Um, I will say the world championship teams probably take, uh, a, we think about a little bit, more years in advance um, than we have the 73 team and, and the 2000 team, but we're just not there on the 2020 calendar, specifically because we haven't, it's taking later for the 2019 calendar to come to be. Uh, there's still a few huge items that we haven't announced yet, so we really haven't started talking about 2020 yet. And, and there have been conversations, just obviously, like Mark said, we're not, we're not there yet. Hey Mark, you know, <laughs> this summer, is the 20th anniversary of the Mercury Mets. Surely the Mets are going to do Mercury Mets night and we'll all get to see the throw-ahead jerseys come back. We are not. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, that I can uh, definitively say. It is something that we consider. We consider everything. Um, as you know, we meet and consider uh, everything promotionally um, and decided to take a pass on that one. So I should not torture Will the entire summer? You've got your answer. <laughs> <laughs> we, we may recognize it on social, but it won't be uh, in ballpark uh, situations. So. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, I didn't even do my first question. What's new at the ballpark? So before you answer that, um, somebody posted, there are some like beautiful like murals, I guess, down by the clubhouse level. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to describe these, but they're just beautiful pictures of players and then colorful <laughs> and, yeah. and and like celebrating the history <laughs> of the Mets. Uh, any chance of that sort of thing more at say on the, the, the field level where generic fan who might not be mm -hmm. hitting the clubhouse could see and what what's new at the ballpark? Yeah, we probably didn't do a good enough of job uh, just showing fans some of the things that we did at the clubhouse level inside the clubhouse. Uh, which was completely redone last year um, with the help of Mickey and, and his vision. Yes, uh, there should be some new items to the ballpark. However, most of those announcements come out. Uh, what will be March 21st, we have a, a new at City Field event where we present all those, which includes you know, some of the upgrades that we'll have to the ballpark, um, along with kind of the new food items. And by that time, some of the bigger promotions uh, that we'll have announced by then. Not a whole lot I can share with you just at this point. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we've seen some other ballparks have pretty short lives. 
City Field to me as a fan feels like it's coming to its own. It, it took a little bit of beat, but the Mets know what to do with this ballpark, know what works, doesn't work. Is there any chance that this ballpark is somehow city aged and will be playing in the Wilpon Dome in the 30s? <laughs> um, I certainly have no knowledge of if that would be the case, but I certainly don't think so. I mean, that's just a personal per perspective. I know that what you're referring to with, with the Texas Rangers uh, and the Atlanta Braves, I think those were different situations. Uh, Atlanta was kind of gifted that ballpark uh, through the Winter Olympics. Texas, excuse me, through the Summer Olympics, thank you. Um, and Texas, with the humidity, uh, really affected their attendance. Uh, with the humidity down in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Arlington area, again, just guess. We have not had any conversations, uh, certainly, about uh, any of that. I mean, we're, City Field looks like it did in 2009, maybe with a little more orange and blue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a question that came from, I, I did some fishing on Facebook. Um, one of the questions that came to me were, how can we educate our fellow fan to um, not be super selfish during at-bats? The specific point was getting up, walking around during at-bats. Can we switch to more of a hockey culture of like, dude, pick your spots when you go get a hot dog? Yeah, it's not easy because we've tried that and we will continue to try that. Our policy is, and I know that it might not be as strictly enforced as some would like, um, our policy is, is that after the third inning, you have to wait for the at-bat to end. If I wanted to look into this psychologically, the difference between us and hockey would be, is hockey, when you wait by the vomitory to go back to your seat, um, there is action happening at that very moment. The way the baseball game goes, there could be a foul ball, and it might seemingly not think that there's action. And fans get kind of, uh, hey, what's going on? Why can't, can't I go back to my seat? However, that is our policy. And one thing that we will also be making announcements on is we would like fans to stay in their seats until an out uh, is made so that they're not going, uh, leaving their seats to go up to um, you know, the uh, concession area until an out has been made. Uh, so that they're not leaving in between pitches. However, it is a different culture than the hockey culture. And um, there, will, there will probably always be it's a little bit, you're always going to have a little bit of uh, some issues there. So I, I hope this group here will join me. I'd really like to give you guys a round of applause for David Wright Day. You, you nailed it. Um, even thinking back on it, like I'm getting the misty eyes that, you know, I had something <laughs> in my eye that night. I think a lot of us did. Um, everything about it, just that it was it was pre-announced, so it wasn't like, hey, psych, yeah. you missed David Wright's last game. We, but right. you wish you were there. Um, the walk-off in the middle of the field. Um, it, my personal anecdote from that night, and this goes back to the younger generations, is, again, it's baseball. Stuff happens that that game kept going into extra innings. Yes. I thought my son was going to run away from home if we didn't, if that game didn't end. We were just sitting there like, can somebody please score? Like, again, I just, it's just a story. I don't know what I want from you, but like, what a beautiful night that was, but man, it would have been a better, it was a nine inning game that night. Yeah, it was an incredible night. And uh, kudos to, you know, our entire front office and ownership who, who made, and, and the players themselves who, who made that night come to be. And I think that goes back to your question about Again, reaching to the younger generation, you know, totally get it. I know the commissioner's office is thought about and I think dismissed uh, anything that goes along with extra innings being regulated differently, uh, like you saw in the World Baseball Classic with runners, I believe, on second and first. Um, but you know what? That gets the commi the commissioner's thinking about it. So uh, he's aware that. You know, it's not that we're so concerned about the length of the game; it's the concern about the action. That that's happening, and I think that you know, folks saw strikeouts, home runs, uh, three and a half minutes between ball and play. Those are the things that the commissioner uh, commissioner's office is studying a lot, and I think you'll see that come up during the next CBA. So we've got a, a few minutes. I'd love to take one or two fan questions. We've got a, a microphone around. Now, again, um, when I invite people to my home, um, this is not a, a floor to get whatever frustrations you might have. These guys aren't signing the free agents. Um, these guys aren't, you know what I'm getting at. Um, so let's just stick to tickets and marketing and social media. But uh, I don't know where the mic is or if somebody has a question. And 
I am a 20 game plan holder. Uh, I like watching batting practice, but by the time I'm allowed to get in as a 20 game plan holder, uh, it's pretty much over. But the 40 game plan holders and the full get in a half hour earlier than me on Saturday. Is there any way we could get a few days where we could get in at that same time to watch batting practice? Good news for you. Yeah, I can take that one. First off, thank you for your support of the Mets in the 2019 season. And, you know, our season ticket holder benefit platform was something we review year over year. And we're excited to announce that, that was actually one of the aspects of our platform that we reviewed this season. And, you know, for 2019, all season ticket holders, full season, half season, and 20 game plan holders are alike will be able to, uh, you know, receive early access in a dedicated line at City Field. There you go, how about that? And for the first question, you get a 2018 Thor bobble. Hat. All right, what do you got? Uh, hi. Um, you haven't had the post game concerts in a few years. Is there any discussion, thoughts of bringing them back? Yes, there is discussion on that. There was discussion both in 2017 and in 18 when we didn't have them. Um, we're always looking for the right act. And right act for a post-game concert is obviously going to be different than the right act for a standalone concert uh, that we've had where we have the ballpark open and there's no game going on. But yes, we are looking at that still for 2019. However, uh, can't confirm at this point if, if one will take place. As <laughs> far <laughs> As far as promotions, I know last year you had the players with the patch for Rusty. Mm -hmm. Is there any, any, any promotions as far as like bobbleheads or whatever for Rusty Staub to remember him? Um, good question. Uh, no, not at this point with Rusty. I believe we honored him during the 50th anniversary. Um, we had talked about uh, in last year, doing, uh, I believe we did something charitable around that patch. Um, but no, not, f not for this year. There, there is no talk about that. Uh, let's do like two more. So what would you say is the Mets brand essence? That's, that's, that's a great, great question, and that's a question that we ask ourselves a, a lot. We want to be family, fun, friendly, inclusive, accessible. Um, we're using the word gritty. We're using the word hard, hard playing, uh, you know, hard working. Um, that's kind of the brand essence that we're going to put to market. One of the things that you're going to see, uh, I was speaking to MJ out there on the way in, and she was one of the season ticket holders that we feature, that we're going to be featuring in a brand campaign this year. Um, we are featuring, featuring um, about nine different types of season ticket holders um, from all backgrounds to show just how inclusive and how diverse we are as a fan base uh, coming from, you know, we play in Queens, which is the most diverse borough in the world. So those will appear on social beginning February 25th, um, where we kind of segment out those nine or ten season ticket holders. And we actually also filmed Alyssa and Howie Rose to show how they kind of grew up as Mets fans and employees, along with Steven Matz and how he grew up as a Mets fan. Um, so that's going to be our go-to-market campaign. And uh, it's not centered really around players. It's centered around you, the fans, and how different you look and how you might speak different languages and have different lifestyles, but you all come together uh, like you are here today as, as one, as Mets fans. So Mark, um, I brought a prop as well. A friend of mine made this. <laughs> this um, <laughs> is a mini statue of someone named Tom Seaver. Uh, the, the idea... <laughs> The idea is we'd, we'd build a giant one of these and <laughs> place it somewhere near City Field. Maybe yeah. fans could take pictures Woo! with it. I know this is universally your decision. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what, what, what goes into, like, how would a statue even come to be? Do you need a corporate sponsor? Does someone have to need a check? Is it a I Kickstarter? So. Do you need Seaver to say, yeah, I want that? Like, no, I, all I can tell, say at this point, since I'm, I'm certainly none of the three of us are involved in that decision, uh, is that over 69 weekend, we've certainly invited Tom and his family, um, and Tom being kind of one of the marquee, the marquee player of our franchise, and certainly the 69 team, we plan on doing some special things around that over that weekend. Fantastic. Um, we're going to wrap it up. 
Um, there's somebody named Daryl Strawberry who needs this desk. Um, All right. So uh, I, I, I'm guessing you'd rather hear from Daryl than me. Absolutely. So I'm going to wrap it up. And Mets Hank. executives, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Take a seat.